Hello, and thank you for joining our webinar entitled Understanding Orthodontic Valuation and Transitions. My name is Doug Koppel with Benson Clark & Koppel. Our firm is located in Greensboro, North Carolina, and we provide services exclusively to orthodontists throughout the nation. We prepare orth orthodontic practice valuations, provide partner location and recruiting services, and provide transition services to both buyers and sellers of orthodontic practices. My background is in public accounting, working with, multinational, with, the, with the multinational accounting firms of KPMG and Ernst Young prior to joining Benson Clark & Koppel in 2004. I'm an accredited valuation analyst, or AVA for short, and prepare our firm's, our firm's valuation reports and handle much of the negotiations between the orthodontist and their advisors throughout the transition process. This is a G-Care Densply sponsored clinical educational program. This presentation is geared toward the resident uh, community and will focus on practice valuations and transitions. The goal is to provide a high level review of aver average practice values, the reasons for differences in practice values, types of practice transitions, and items to consider when buying into a practice. So let's dive right in. The first thing we're going to talk about here is the transition timeline. Uh, we have six steps on this slide. The first is the information gathering process. Um, the next is the practice valuation piece and finding a buyer or seller. These two items, practice valuation and finding a buyer or seller, are actually interchangeable. Uh, we represent a lot of sellers in these transactions. Uh, we have sellers that come to us that say, I want to sell my practice. I do not have a buyer yet, but I'd like to start the valuation process and also at the same time find a buyer. Uh, you may also, we also have sellers that come to us that already have a buyer in mind and say, you know, I already have a buyer. I'm ready to get the, the process started. So obviously those two are interchangeable. The next piece is the transition negotiations. This is where you're actually uh, negotiating uh, the price, the terms of the buy-in, or even the employment period uh, or the buyout terms. Um, the next piece is the association period. This is actually where you, as a junior doctor, begin working in the practice as an employee. And notice that the transition negotiations uh, are before the association period. The reason for that is we highly recommend that you do not enter into a practice whether it's just an employment arrangement or an employment arrangement with a future buyout opportunity, uh, to enter into a practice before you have everything in writing and before you've negotiated the transaction. The reason is if you enter into a, uh, into a practice as an employee under a handshake deal and with the, with the uh, promise to buy in in the future, uh, it always happens or some things happen that um, uh, you know, the seller says, hey, I want to sell my practice in six months or a year. Six months or a year passes, and then uh, you go, you approach the seller or the senior doctor, and he says, he or she says, well, actually, I'm not ready to sell my practice yet. Or the time comes to have the practice valued, and the valuation comes back way higher than you expected. So the expectations have not been set. So you want to make sure those negotiations are done and everything is in writing before you step foot into the practice as an employee. Same thing goes if you just plan to be just an employee of the practice. You don't want to enter into the practice under a handshake. Uh, you want to have the employment agreement in writing so you understand when you're going to get paid, how much you're going to be paid, how many days per week you plan to work, uh, what your responsibilities with marketing, managing staff, things like that. This final piece is the ownership transfer, and this is after everything has been negotiating, the employment uh, period has happened, uh, the, the, the ownership is actually transferred uh, to the junior doctor. We're going to focus on the last three items on this list. Uh, my partner, Chris Benson of Benson, Clark & Koppel, has actually already done a webinar with GCARE called Locating a Practice Associateship or Purchase Opportunity, and he focused primarily on the first three items of this list. So we're going to focus on the transition negotiations first in this webinar. There's multiple types of transitions that you can be a part of as a newly graduated resident. Um, this is a listing that includes uh, a list of nine types of transitions that is actually from Bob Schultz's website. Um, Bob Schultz, uh, as many of you know, is um, sort of a national mentor uh, to many people, retired orthodontist, uh, affectionately referred to as, as Uncle Bob. Uh, but he has this on his website, and we, we, we show this to a lot of residents throughout the country. But if you step back <clears throat> and look at this, there's really three types of, of, of transactions here, or, three, or transitions. First is the employment opportunity. And that can be an associateship in a practice. It could be that you're an employee of a, of a large corporate entity. You may be an employee of a smaller one-doctor practice. 
you may be an employee of another dental specialist, whether a pediatric dentist, a general dentist, uh, or something like that. He also says gypsy orthodontist. That's maybe that you're working for, for several orthodontists or several offices, or maybe you, you, know, you go sort of different places throughout the country that you, know, you want to live here for a little while and you go find a job and then, and then rotate around. The next uh, type of transaction is a startup, and that is where you're going to obviously go hang your own shingle, start from scratch, uh, start from nothing. Um, uh, we have a lot of people that do those, or not a lot of people, but we know of people that do, that do those. Uh, Benson Clark and Koppel does not exactly work with startup practices, um, so we don't have a hand in those, but we know of them. Um, the other piece is some type of buyout, whether it's a, a, you're going to buy a practice out completely and you'll be the sole owner of that practice, or you'll be, uh, you'll be a partner in a practice, so you buy in and become a partner. Uh, so it could be an associateship lien to a buyout or to a partnership arrangement. We're going to focus, like I said, we, we don't really deal with startups. We really deal with transactions of, of buys and sells of, of orthodontic practices. So we're going to focus here on uh, buyouts and partnerships and also look at some, um, some terms with employment arrangements. Uh, the first one is a buyout transition. And we refer to a buyout transaction as where the junior doctor is buying the entire practice in one transaction. So they will buy the practice and own 100% of, of the practice after the transaction. So we refer to it as 100% buyout or a buyout. We're going to talk about some issues here to consider and negotiate when you're buying a practice. First is the price. Um, a lot of people focus on the price when they're buying a practice. You know, how much am I paying? Am I paying 80% uh, of collections or 60% of collections or some multiple like that? Uh, we'll get into price and valuations a little bit later into this webinar, but the thing I always tell a lot of people is that price uh, is important at the beginning, but it ends up being not one of the most heavily negotiated items in a transaction. There are a lot of other things to consider. The asset allocation is another thing to consider. Um, and again, we'll go through this later on in the presentation also, but, but simply in these transactions, you're not buying the stock of the corporation. You're buying specific assets from the seller, selling doctor. And so if you're going to pay a million dollars for a practice, you want to understand what are you buying. Are you buying fixed assets and accounts receivable and goodwill? So there's an allocation of that purchase price. And again, we'll get into that a little bit later into the, into the presentation. Another item to consider is financing terms. And this could be uh, who is financing the deal for you. Are you going to a bank and paying all cash for the, for the practice? Is the seller going to finance some or all of the transaction price for you? Uh, do you have family members? Um, we'll talk about financing a little bit later in the webinar also. But um, uh, things to consider there, you know, what's my interest rate? What are the repayment periods? You know, can I afford this deal? Another big item to consider is lease terms, and we actually don't have another slide on leases, so we'll talk about it here in detail. Um, lease terms and lease arrangements are actually one of the, can sometimes be one of the more hotly negotiated, negotiated items in these transactions, whether you're dealing with the selling orthodontist that owns the facility or you're dealing with a third-party landlord. In situations where the selling doctor owns the facility, uh, first of all, the selling doctor a lot of times does not know what the actual fair market rental rate is for the building that they own. They may have been paying themselves a certain lease rate for the past you know, five or ten years, and uh, it should have been adjusted. It may be that they're paying themselves more than market because they want to do it for, for tax reasons or shifting money to their children. Um, they may actually not be paying themselves any rent. Um, so during this process, when we're doing evaluation for a seller, we usually try to have that seller uh, speak to some real estate experts in the area to figure out what the actual fair market rental rate is. Most do that, some do not. Um, but um, usually you need to have a real estate expert to help you out in this process. Um, even after the seller has done it, a lot of times the buyer also gets his own real estate uh, expert to help out uh, to, to determine the fair market rental rate. And what you'll see is a lot of times the seller's on the high end and the, and the buyer's on the low end. So obviously there needs to be some negotiation there. Um, the other thing to think about is what are the options to purchase or right of first refusal for the building. Uh, you want to understand if, if I'm going to buy this practice, what are my chances of ultimately owning this building? We have you know, a couple of situations where one is the senior doctor wants to sell the building, but the buyer does not want to buy the building. 
this may be where uh, it's not the best part of town, maybe it's not the nicest office, uh, maybe it's not laid out like the buyer wants. So really the buyer, buyer just wants to lease the space for a number of years and ultimately go relocate. Uh, the seller is not happy with that because obviously it's an orthodontic, it's an orthodontic office. Um, the tenants you know, really needs to be an orthodontist or some type, other type of dental specialist. So they prefer that they sell the building to the buyer of the practice. So if you have that situation, that can be you know, something we're looking at because the buyer says or the seller says, I don't want to own this, this office for the next 10 years and not have a tenant. We also have situations where the seller wants to continue to own the facility for a number of years for retirement reasons, uh, just for the rental income. And in those cases, it may be that the buyer wants to own the facility. And so those are negotiations to say, when can the option to, to, to purchase the facility come into play? Um, you know, especially if the buyer understands and knows that I want to eventually own my own real estate for financial reasons and tax reasons, if the seller's not willing to, to sell that office, that needs to be known at the beginning so we don't have a, a long, drawn-out process there of the seller or the buyer trying to, to, to relocate and the seller not happy with that. Now, if you're dealing with a third-party landlord, um, the issue becomes uh, you know, speaking with the landlord just to begin with because these are confidential transactions. A lot of times the seller does not want the landlord to know that he or she is selling their practice. So first of all, the seller says, I don't want you to talk to my landlord first because you know, the landlord may know everybody in town. So that causes an issue. So a lot of times you have to go through the other negotiation process of we've agreed on these other items. Now we can talk about the lease terms and you can talk to the landlord. Once you begin talking to the landlord as the buyer, if you, if you step back and think about you know, what the landlord's point of view is and put yourself in his shoes, <clears throat> the landlord has been leasing this office space to an orthodontist for a number of years. That orthodontist is established, has been paying the lease, lease rate for a long time, is usually pretty well off now, makes, makes good money. Now he's being asked to lease this same space to a newly graduated resident orthodontist that uh, probably has no assets and just a pile of, of uh, student debt uh, to his name. So he's suddenly being asked to lease this space to someone that is not exactly as financially worthy or credit worthy as the selling doctor. Um, so a lot of times the landlord will want to get information on the buyer. The landlord will also request uh, that the seller stay on as a personal guarantee to the lease so that if the buyer quits making lease payments, uh, the seller is on the hook to continue those lease payments. Obviously, the seller doesn't want to do that, so this can be a negotiated point. Uh, again, I bring all these things up just because uh, we've had lease, lease arrangements in transactions that actually delay the delay the sale, or actually almost cause them to fall through. So this is a big item to think about when you're negotiating a, a practice purchase. The other thing to think about is transition periods as far as pre- and post-closing employment periods for the buyer and the seller. Uh, we have transactions and buyouts where the buyer does not work for the seller before buying the practice. Uh, they buy the practice immediately, and then the seller works back for the buyer for some period of time. We have uh, where the buyer works for you know, 12 or 24 months, and then buys the practice completely, and the seller walks away, and we have overlapping where you know the buyer works for the seller for a period of time, and the seller works for, back for the, for the buyer for a period of time. That needs to be negotiated. Um, it depends on, again, your confidence level, the size of the practice, how comfortable you are with owning your, uh, a practice, as, as far as how long you want that transition period to be. But what we try to stress is if you know that your ultimate goal is to buy a practice and you'd rather do that sooner rather than later, then you that needs to be negotiated. The seller is saying, you know, I want this to be a four-year employment period, then you can buy me out. Well, that may not fit your timeline. So again, this is why we want these things in writing and understand uh, before you enter the practice. The other term, uh, the other thing to think about is the terms of the pre- and post-closing employment periods, you know, compensation levels, days work, things like that. And we have some other slides here in this presentation that will talk about that. <coughs> the next is a partnership transaction. Uh, this is where uh, you're not buying a practice entirely, you're, you're becoming a co-owner of an existing practice. And uh, it may be that you're buying some incrementally, it may be that you're, you're going from a one-doctor practice to a two-doctor practice and you're becoming that partner. And there are a lot of things to consider with partnership transactions. Um, we have the exact same things to consider as a 100% buyout, plus we have these other things to consider. Uh, first is that uh, we what percentage purchase and over what period of time. 
with partnership deals, it's not always the case that the buyer immediately buys 50% of the practice, especially after a short association period. It may be that the buyer is, is buying 10% per year or 20% now and 10, 10, 10, or um, 25% now and 25% later, or something to that effect. Because what we tell, what we try to remind buyers of is there are really only two reasons that senior doctors want to create a partnership, especially one doctor practices that want to go from one doctor practice to a two doctor practice. The first reason is that the, uh, the senior doctor, the selling doctor, uh, their practice is growing significantly and they're getting where they cannot manage it, manage it anymore by themselves. So they need a, a junior doctor to become a partner with them uh, to have equity in the practice and also have the same visions and goals and want to grow the practice, and they both, they're both fully invested in it. Uh, a lot of times senior doctors don't want to you know, grow practices and just basically be a revolving door for, for other orthodontist associates to come through. So uh, the way to get somebody long-term is to actually you know, sell them an interest in the practice and both, both people reap the rewards. The other reason uh, that senior doctors want to do partnerships um, is for uh, usually the senior doctor is getting close to retirement. Uh, they want a lifestyle change. They want to have more time off, and they understand they're going to make less money because this is an expensive proposition for the selling doctor to sell an ownership interest in their practice or a partial ownership interest in their practice. And so usually the senior doctor is taking a pay decrease during this unless the practice grows a lot. So again, that's why it's usually it's growing so much that they need a partner, or the senior doctor says, you know, I just want some more time off. I understand I'll make less money. Uh, so that may be a case where, you know, maybe you do buy 50% immediately, but the senior doctor gets a lot more time off. Um, uh, but it can be an expensive proposition, so be, er, you need to understand that uh, of what you're buying, because it's not always just that you immediately get 50%. The other thing to consider is how to split income. You know, when you, when you buy a practice completely, obviously you get 100% of that income that comes to you. Uh, once you become a partner, there's different ways to allocate the income. It may be that some some amount is based upon day's work, and the rest is based upon either ownership or some incremental increase per year. It may be that the two doctors have uh, set salaries with maybe a differential in the salaries, and everything after that is split based on ownership. Um, but there's different ways to do that. We've had transactions before where buyers come to us and say, man, I've got this great deal. Here's how it's going to work. And then we look at the documents, and there's not even um, – uh, there's, there's nothing that addresses how the income is split. And that's one of the main things that you're worried about because you know, when you buy into a practice, you're buying an income stream. And you want to make sure you understand what that income stream is going to be to you after you become a partner. The length of the partnership needs to be negotiated. Um, when you have a practice that's a younger doctor uh, that is growing like crazy and they need a, a junior doctor to come in and become their partner, that may be an open-ended partnership arrangement. Uh, because you know, the practice is young, the, the senior doctor is young, and they want a long-term partner. You may have a situation where you have a senior doctor that's you know, 58 years old and wants a partner and wants to retire in 62 or 63 years, or excuse me, when they're 62 or 63 years old. In that case, you want the agreements to state uh, when that partner will be bought out, because what you don't want is entering into a practice hoping that, uh, that the seller is going to retire in five years only to find out that, oh, they actually want to work to their 70. And so then you have an issue of, you know, I thought I was going to be a, a sole proprietor or own my own practice after four or five-year partnership arrangement. Now I've got, uh, you know, an older partner that doesn't want to leave yet and isn't, isn't working as hard and isn't producing as much. So if, if the seller, if the intention is for the seller to retire, you know, make sure that that's in writing so it doesn't extend beyond uh, when you think it should be extending. We've uh, been in, involved with with uh, partnership arrangements where they had a handshake agreement that the senior doctor was going to retire once he got to a certain age. And with the economy, economy like it's been, that was extended because it wasn't in writing. So we had, you know, we had to deal with some, uh, some transactions like that where we were trying to negotiate how do we lengthen this thing and be fair to both parties and, and ultimately accomplish what they want to accomplish. Another thing is buy-sell arrangements. Remember, you're only buying a portion of the practice to begin with. So the buy-sell arrangement says, what happens or when do I get to buy more of the practice? Uh, what happens if we die or become disabled? What happens if one of us wants to retire? What are the notice, notice periods that have to be given? Do I have to give you 180 days notice before I can retire? Um, what happens um, if there's penalties, for example? What if uh, one person has to leave because they lose their license or they're terminated for cause or something bad happens? 
how does the remaining partner buy off the departing uh, partner's interest? You don't want to get into a situation where when it's time for that partner to retire, then you're negotiating, here's how we calculate the purchase price, here's how I pay you back, oh, you want all cash? You know, that's not what I expected. So uh, you want to make sure all those things are in the document that, that, that tells how uh, the departing doctor leaves, how they're paid, and things like that. So these four things here, we, what we tell a lot of people is, is when you're entering into a transaction like this, or a partnership arrangement, there's three real questions you're trying to answer is, how do I get into the deal? What happens to me while I'm in the deal? And how do I get out of the deal? So that's really what you're trying to answer with those things. You know, how do I get in? What happens while I'm there? How do I get out? Uh, and that's what these four things are really covering. This last item, which is you know, a lot of times the most important, is compatibility of the two doctors. Um, you know, if you're doing a buyout or 100% sale, um, it may be that uh, you know you don't exactly have to like each other for a long time. I mean, obviously, the seller wants to to sell his pra his or her practice to uh, somebody that will continue their tradition and treat patients well and things like that. But you don't have to live together day to day. In the partnership arrangement, you will be working together, you'll be treating cases together, you'll be managing your practice together, you'll probably be spending more time with this person than you spend with your own spouse. So. Um, we want to make sure that the, the two are, are compatible. You know, we call this basically a business marriage. You don't want to go through a divorce. So, uh, you know, do you have the same philosophies? Do you have the same management style? Uh, maybe you don't, but you have uh, your strengths um, uh, help out the other's weaknesses. We have uh, tr uh, partnership arrangements where one doctor really loves the clinical aspect of it and the other doctor loves the marketing aspect of it. And so, you know, they focus on those two things. And they both understand the roles. But again, you want to make sure uh, that you're compatible because to go through a, a divorce or a separation in these uh, partnership arrangements can get very messy. Next, we're going to talk about rules of thumbs for valuations. So this is really that first thing on the list when we're talking about things to consider for, for buyouts or, or partnership arrangements, which is the price. <clears throat> How much you, should you pay for a practice? Well, everybody talks about rules of thumbs. And they always say, well, what should my practice be valued at? And we always say, well, you know, there's averages out there, but, but don't exactly listen to the averages. But everybody wants to know them, so we, we talk about them. The first one that you always hear about is percentage of collections. What's the value of the practice as a percentage of collections? What price am I paying as a percentage of collections? And the average is approximately 73 to 77% of collections. But be very careful. That's only an average. The, um, the actual range, if you were to stack up 100 uh, practices together and look at actually what they are sold for, it, it, it varies significantly. We have practices that have sold for 45% of collections. We have some that have sold for 95 or close to 100% of collections. Just because you're paying 60% of collections doesn't mean you're getting a, a screaming great deal uh, or a bargain or anything. Uh, it may be that the practice should be valued at that. Uh, just because you're paying 90% of collections doesn't mean you're getting a bad deal. So. There's various ranges in there, and the reason that they um, that they that they vary so much uh, for multiple reasons: um, profitability of the practice, uh, quality of of the staff, quality of the equipment, location of the practice, uh, whether it's in the nation uh, or in in the actual town that it's in. Uh, we have practices in California and New York City and, and Florida and Texas that sell for a lot more than, you know, name a state in the central part of the country or, uh, or the Midwest or something like that. They sell for, for more. Large metropolitan areas sell for more than rural areas. Um, it may not be significantly more, but, but they do. Um, uh, also, if you have even within the same town, you know, if you're in the, the selling doctors in a dying part of the town, uh, it may sell for less than one uh, that's in the nice part of town. So uh, there's a lot of reasons for why uh, the practice values and prices vary. The other one that you probably don't hear as much about is percentage of adjusted profits. Um, and when we say adjusted profits, we're talking about the practice's profits after we make adjustments to actually see what the, the orthodontist is making, the total economic benefit that the, that the doctor is receiving. You can't just pick up a P&L or a tax return and say, oh, his net income was X amount, and therefore, you know, multiply it by 150%, and that's the practice value. It doesn't exactly work like that because a lot of doctors run through a lot of stuff through their practice. They may have their children on payroll. They, um, they may be running through their country club dues or, you know, um, entertainment or vacations. 
Uh, they may be, you know, they may own the building and paying themselves more or less rent than they're supposed to be paying. There's a lot of ways to uh, to run things through your practice. They may be getting a lot of retirement contributions and their practice is really income to them. So first of all, you got to figure out what adjusted profits are, which can be a process. But once you get to that, um, practices are often valued between or sell for 100, 140% to you know a little bit more than 200% of profit. And so um, the average is right around, you know, say 170 or so. The reason we look at these two in tandem is because you may have a practice that has a very high overhead. Uh, maybe it has a, you know, 65% overhead. In that case, the profitability is less. So it, may, it may sell for, you know, a higher multiple of profits, but a lower percentage of collections. And vice versa, if you have a practice that's doing uh, has an overhead rate of 42%, which is really low, it may sell uh, as a lower a percentage of profits but a higher percentage of collections and the reason we look at those two in tandem again is because what we do normally say is that a lot of practices revert back to the mean uh, you know if you're looking at a practice that has 42 percent overhead rate chances are over the long term you cannot continually or continue to operate that practice at 42 percent overhead you're probably going to you know spend more money in the future same thing if you have a practice doing 65 percent overhead um, you know it, Hopefully, you're going to be able to reduce that in some way. Maybe you grow the, the top line so that so the uh, uh, the overhead rate decreases, or maybe they're paying too much for the staff, and you 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 adjust their staff uh, benefits and salaries and things. But but eventually, you know, hopefully, you're going to get in that range between you know, 55 and 60 percent of collections for an overhead rate. This is a uh, financial illustration of the valuation price uh, to sort of show how the two two multiples we were just talking about interrelate. This is an example practice, a sort of a, a standard average type practice, uh, collecting about a million dollars uh, per year. The overhead rate is about 55%, so the profit is therefore $450,000, and again, that's the adjusted profit. If that practice sells for 170% of profit, it's, uh, it's selling for $765,000. Well, that also equals 76.5% of collection. So therefore, you can see that you know these things sort of coincide for the average practice. Now, obviously, if you change the overhead rates, those multiples may change. Again, if you take it up to 65%, it may sell for you know 185% of profit, but 68% uh, you know, of collection or something like that. I'm just making those numbers up. But at least you get the idea here. And again, there's, there's many reasons uh, why practices uh, sell for different prices. This slide has a lot going on on it, but um, the reason we put it in here is to show that there's variations in what practices are valued at versus what they ultimately sell for. Okay, it's, it's very much like listing a house. Uh, just because the list price said that you know you're trying to sell it for three hundred thousand dollars doesn't mean that's ultimately what uh, a buyer is going to pay for it. Uh, the definition of fair market value that we use in our practice evaluations is the price at which property would change hands between a willing buyer and a willing seller, neither under any compulsion to buy or sell, and both having reasonable knowledge of the facts. What you'll see in some cases, you don't have a willing buyer or willing seller. There's other reasons that uh, practices sell for more or less than they're valued for. So if you look at um, this, uh, this slide, the far left-hand corner, or column has net collections of the practice. Then we have the adjusted overhead rate and the practice income. This is the amount that the practice was actually valued for. So this is the appraised amount per evaluation report. This is the value as a percentage of collections. This is the purchase price. This is actually what the practice sold for. And again, price as a percentage of collections. And this is the difference in the valued amount versus the purchase price. So we, um, we put these things in here. Uh, just to give you some examples of what you what you could see, the first four actually sold for uh, exactly what they were valued at, and that's the case in a lot of these transactions as long as the valuation is done properly. Um, but the reason we put this range in here is you'll see that one sold for 69% of collections, and that's what it was valued for. Another one sold for nearly 90% of collections. Again, just because you're paying 90% of collections doesn't mean it's an unfair price or it's a bad deal. Just because you're paying 70% of collection doesn't mean it's a screaming buy. Uh, there, there may be issues with that, that you're going to have to spend some money in the practice, or maybe the overhead is extremely high, or something like that. The next two we put in here are ones that actually sold for more than what they were valued at. And that seems uh, maybe seem foreign to some of you, but we actually do have 
sellers that, you know, after we do the valuation or we see a valuation, they say, I know that's what it was valued at, but I'm selling it for more. In that case, you may not have a willing seller. You have a seller that, uh, you know, says, I'm only going to sell the practice if I get more out of it. Um, in these cases, uh, these are ones that we know of that um, the, the practice was in a nice area. Uh, it was growing, and uh, the orthodontist uh, had multiple buyers interested in the, in the practice. So basically they said, you know, uh, you know, this is the value price, but I've got six people interested in it, so I'm going to ask more for it. Somebody did that. Uh, so you may see that uh, every so often. The last four here are ones that actually sold for a lot less than the valued amount. And um, the reason we put these in here, again, is to sort of walk through some, some reasons why, why they may sell for less. Uh, actually, the first one there with a $140,000 discount was an estate sale. The, the uh, orthodontist had passed away, and therefore there was a big discount uh, to the estate. Um, this, this next to last one sold for a big discount. And the reason we put these in here, these are transactions that we did not do the valuation. We advised the buyer on these. And the... Um, and, the, and somebody else actually did the valuation for the seller. We don't put these in here to, to bash anybody else or to toot our own horn or anything, but really put these in here for two reasons. To show that, you know, you really need to get an advisor in these types of transactions and, uh, and to be wary or be careful with dual representation in these transactions. Um, and I don't, I'm not saying exactly just to, just to get an advisor because that's what we do. Obviously, that sounds biased. But... Um, but um, you may have transactions like this where you'll see a valuation like this. This was valued at 120% of collections. Now, the overhead was extremely low, but the buyer knew that it could not continue to operate the practice like this. Um, <clears throat> so the valuator actually put the value at 120% of collections, and then we negotiated it down quite a bit from there. One is, uh, the reason to get advisors is, these are big transactions with a lot of money, and you don't want to screw these up and be under way too much debt for a long period of time. Uh, the other thing is, if you don't get an advisor, just imagine if you're walking into uh, the seller's office to say, "I really love your practice," and you know, but hey, I think it's overvalued by three hundred forty thousand dollars. Well, the seller is probably going to laugh you out of his office or beat you out of his office. Uh, same thing if you say that to the advisor is, you know, hey, you know, uh, I don't like the price on this, you know, and especially by three hundred forty thousand dollars, they're going to say. That advisor may say, this buyer's crazy, let's go to somebody else. But if you have an advisor that can walk you through that process, deal with the other advisor, give reasons why this price is, is way too high, you, you, know, you have a chance of, of um, getting the price down. Now, some, some sellers just won't budge until you know, they've gone through several buyers, but, um, but you want to make sure you have somebody advocating for you. Um, the other reason is, again, dual representation. Uh, we know there's advisors out there that do dual representation. We've done dual representation in certain instances. But the problem that we see with dual representation is that, you know, obviously if I'd have done this valuation and came up with 1.114 million for the price, and then I'm advising both parties, you know, and the buyer questions me on that valuation, and they say, was it fair? It seems high to me. Well, you know, obviously I did the valuation, right? You know, I think it's fair. Um, you know, I wouldn't be wrong. I wouldn't mislead you. So it's hard in those situations to really question uh, the advisor. You're not just questioning the seller then, you're also questioning the advisor and, and all his expertise. Um, and also, you don't even know what questions to ask. Um, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So it's it's helpful to make sure you have an advisor that's looking out for you, you know, can, can tell you the pros and cons, at least if they can even say, here are the cons, but, you know, if you want to do it, do it. But at least you've, you've entered into this transaction with your eyes wide open. And so be wary of dual representation because, you um, you know, it's really hard to negotiate with uh, an advisor that's done more of these than you and has done the practice valuation. I mean, how do you really argue certain of those things? Um, so just think about those things. This is the tax allocation that we talked about on the, uh, one of the earlier slides. Again, if you're going to buy a practice, uh, how much are you paying? How much are you paying for the assets? There's a lot going on in, in this slide, too, and this isn't meant to be a tax course or anything, but... Um, but again, you're buying specific assets from the seller. So this far left-hand column says, here's the asset that you're buying. The middle column is the tax treatment for the seller, and the left-hand column is the tax treatment for the buyer. Uh, what you'll see in the middle column is that there's actually different tax ramifications uh, for the seller depending on what type of corporation he is, whether he's a C-corp, an S-corp, or he's unincorporated, or he's an LLC. 
actually these next two slides sort of go through these two um, these two tax ramifications, this allocation. Um, the purchaser gets a tax deduction for the assets that they purchase. Uh, when I say tax deduction, that means you get a tax write-off. And let's say uh, you get a tax tax write-off or a tax deduction of fifteen thousand dollars in one year. That's a non-cash deduction, and all it's doing all it's doing is reducing your taxable income and thereby reducing your tax liability. So you're getting a tax benefit for the assets you, you purchased. And there's different time frames of when you get that tax benefit. Uh, generally, the buyer wants as quick a write-off as possible. So, for example, fixed assets can be depreciated over, it says, 3 to 10 years here. Um, it may be quicker under certain depreciation methods and things. Uh, but you're getting a, a decently quick write-off. With supplies and accounts that's receivable, you're basically going to get a write-off that year that you buy them. So if you spend $40,000 on supplies and accounts receivable, you will get a tax deduction of $40,000 for that year of the transaction. The other items, the, the orthodontic contracts and other intangibles on, on the next slide here, which is good, goodwill and patient records and things, those are all considered t intangibles and are all 15-year amortization view, which means you get a tax deduction for 15 years each year. So if you spend $150,000 on that intangible, you get a $10,000 tax deduction for the next 15 years. The buyer's intent, again, is to get the quickest deduction possible and to get a tax benefit as quickly as possible. The seller's goal is to get uh, most as they can in capital gain, which is a lower tax rate. As you, I'm sure you, everybody's heard about capital gains rates were probably going up in 2013, going from 15% to 20 to 25%. Or in your income tax rates, the highest bracket may be going from 30 to 35%, or excuse me, 35% to nearly 40%. But still, there's a big difference between ordinary income and capital gains. So the seller wants capital gains. What you'll see in this chart is usually where the seller is getting capital gains, the buyer is getting a 15-year amortization. So, you know, usually if it's good for the seller, it's not the best for the buyer. But we also try to point out is that you are getting a tax deduction for the entire purchase price. That's the, that's the buyer. Um, so if you pay $800,000 for a practice, over some period of time, you're going to get a tax deduction or total tax deduction of $800,000. So there's, there's tax benefits to you. Uh, and the, and the, the reality is... Um, the majority of these purchase prices are goodwill. Um, they're sometimes intangible, and it's mostly capital gains for the for the seller. So usually anywhere between 65 to 80 percent of the total uh, purchase price is capital gains uh, to the seller. Okay. Um, the last thing we have on here is the consulting agreement. Um, there's in small or in some cases some of the purchase price may be repaid as a consulting agreement payment over some period of time. Uh, this basically converts a portion of the goodwill to uh, to ordinary income payment to the to the seller, but the buyer gets to expense that as the payments are made. Um, so instead of getting a 15-year amortization period, if it's paid over seven years, you get a seven-year uh, deduction. So it's quicker for you. The problem is it becomes ordinary income to the to the seller, and that's actually money out of his pocket. There's also some other other reasons that we don't exactly like them and don't see them very often, honestly. But but sometimes you might hear them. Uh, some uh, some legal reasons and stuff. The attorneys don't like them. Um, but again, there's a lot going on in this, and, and we'll actually cover this a little bit when we get to uh, the cash flow model on things. And this is a cash flow. Um, this is um, uh, basically a cash flow that says that helps you ask the buyer determine uh, is this reasonable? Uh, is this a reasonable purchase price? and a reasonable transaction for me to enter into. And we prepare these cash flow projections in almost every transaction we're involved with. And um, especially in buyout transactions, these are very important to the buyer. You know, the seller sort of knows, you know, they're getting some chunk of cash and they're going to pay some taxes on it. But you as the buyer, you need to understand over a period of time, can I repay the debt, can I pay my taxes, and still have enough left over uh, to live off of? So that's what this, this cash flow is doing. Um, so we're going to walk through some of this. Uh, first of all, we have, the, um, we have the, uh, the same practice that we've been talking about throughout this presentation, which is a million-dollar practice. So here, the year one collections are $1 million. Operating expenses are 55%. And the practice is sold for about 76%, 77% of collections. This is the asset allocation that we we're talking about. Of the $766,000, what are you buying? You're buying some supplies. 
you're buying some accounts receivable, you're buying some fixed assets for a certain amount of money, and then the majority of the purchase price is some type of personal goodwill or, or uh, intangible asset. So, um, again, this is sort of an average practice that you may buy. Okay. Um, now let's talk sort of, let's just go from the top to the bottom here. First thing in these projections is you want to say, you want to have some type of reasonable or nominal growth rate. Uh, and we're using 1.5% here. You don't want to enter into a transaction knowing that the only way this makes sense is for the practice to grow by 25% uh, per year. Uh, because if it has to grow by that, then it probably means you're overpaid for the practice or some other issues with the practice. Uh, now, obviously, if you're buying a smaller practice, say a practice that's doing, you know, 400 or 500,000 in collections, you know, just to repay the debt, you know, you're going to have to grow the practice or have a longer repayment period. But you don't want to have a projection that, that has, you know, significantly high growth rates. Uh, we've got the operating expenses. Now we have the capital expenditures. This means um, this is where uh, you're actually buying some equipment every year. We sort of do an average. It may be that in year one, you're spending $60,000 in year one and then nothing for four or five years. But again, you want some type of allowance that I'm going to have to you know, make some upgrades to the equipment. I've got to replace some computers every year, things like that. Number four is the buyer's benefits and personal expenses. You'll be running some certain things through the practice, um, you know, just like health insurance, retirement contributions and things. Uh, so if you know you want to be spending some money on that, you want to put that in there. This number five is the seller's post-closing compensation. This is where we put in what the seller wants to be paid or how long they'll stay on a some type of per diem basis or something like that. We want to put this in here because we have some sellers that, you know, they want to work back for three or four years at making two or three hundred thousand dollars a year. Once we show them the cash flow, it sees that this won't work. So uh, it needs to be reasonable. You need to make sure you can afford it just because the seller wants to get paid X amount of money. It doesn't mean that you can afford to pay them that. Um, the next thing here, uh, or, or let's, let's look at this number here. This is the practice income. So let's say in, in your number two, you have practice income after paying operating expenses and, and you know, if the seller stays for, for some period of time, after paying those items, you have practice income of $421,000 in year two. But ultimately, you really don't care about that number. What you still want to know is, okay, that's great. I made that much from the practice, but I still got to pay my debt. I got some tax deductions, and I got to pay some taxes. Do I still have enough money left over to do this? So these next items are items that relate to the actual purchase transaction. Um, first of all, we have to break down uh, the, the loan repayment. So here we have purchased interest on the loan. This is the $766,000 you're going to repay over a period of time. In, these, in this, uh, or this cash flow, we have a seven-year debt repayment. We usually try to use seven years because in these types of buyouts, you should be able to repay the, the, the purchase debt over seven years and still be able to afford the practice. Now, obviously, you have a smaller practice. That may change. Uh, you have a high student loan. You may want to get a 10-year debt repayment. Actually, when you buy these practices, a lot of times the debt repayment is over 10 years, but we still want to run our cash flows over seven years to make sure that, you know, if you have to do this over 10 years, it probably may not make sense for you. Um, or maybe the overhead's too high and you've got to work on reducing that. Maybe the practice is small, you know, you have to grow it. But we usually use seven years in these transactions. Uh, first of all, the purchase interest, we, we break it down between purchase interest and purchase principal. The uh, purchased interest is a portion of the debt repayment that relates only to interest and is a deductible expenditure when you make that payment. So we have it broken out into principal versus interest. The principal is not deductible, um, and that is because the deductions, the tax deductions you're getting, that you're getting is based upon the asset allocation and the IRS rules for when you can deduct those assets that you purchased. So uh, we're trying to break this down into, you know, is it deductible or not? Next, number seven, eight, and nine, these are the tax deductions that you're getting for the assets that you purchased. So again, you know, we sort of walked through that before, say supplies and AR deductible in year one, uh, depreciation of fixed assets occurs over a number of years, um, the amortization of the intangibles purchases over 15 years. If you were to add up all those tax deductions, they would equal $766,000. It's just you're getting them at different years, okay? The, uh, the reason we want to put these tax deductions in here is because your debt repayment doesn't always match your tax deductions. And so uh, there may be some years that you're receiving less tax deductions than you're actually paying on your loan, and that's what you'll see here in number 10 and 11. Um, again, these, these deductions are, are simply 
non-cash tax deductions or tax benefits that the IRS allows you for the assets you should purchase. So it's just reducing your taxable income. Now we, we assume you've paid estimated taxes of 35%, uh, and now we've got some of these adjustments to arrive at after, after tax cash flows. One again, the principal repayments are not deductible. So we've, we've, uh, we've separated those out to show that they're not deductible. And then here in number 11, we're actually adding back all the non-cash tax deductions above, which are the depreciation, amortization of the intangibles. Because again, since they're non-cash, they're just, they're just decreasing your taxable income and decreasing your tax liability, but they're not actually cash outflow to you. So we're adding them back here. So the ultimate goal, what we're trying to show you here, is you know, in year two, for example, you have a net cash flow after paying your debt, after receiving your tax deductions, and after paying your taxes of $172,000. And you know, then you can make the decision of, can I live off this or not? Uh, and can I pay my student debt? Can I pay my, you know, pay my housing and things like that? Um, so again, th this gets in you know, the detail here, and this is not an accounting course or anything, but the purpose is you want to have one of these cash flows done uh, when you're looking at a practice to make sure you can afford it. The next one is, uh, let's look at a buy-in or a partnership arrangement. This is actually a partnership that we have done. Uh, the purchase price was about $1.8 million. The practice was grossing uh, $2.2 million. It had an overhead rate of 52%, so the value was about 80% of collections. The buyer was going to buy 50% of the practice for a purchase price of $900,000. So here we have the allocation of the purchase price, and the $900,000 was repaid over seven years at 7.25% interest. Okay? So this is the cash flow for a buy-in. Now, when I was talking about the buyout, a lot of times the, the cash flow projections are really most important to the buyer because, again, they want to make sure they can understand this and they can afford it. With, with a buy-in uh, or of a partnership arrangement, the cash flows are very equally important to the buyer and the seller because the buyer, again, has to make sure they can, they can afford this transaction. And the seller also has to make sure they can afford it because, again, with these partnership deals, the, buyer's taking, or the seller's taking a pay cut once he gives up some ownership interest, okay? So this cash flow is, is actually very similar to the last cash flow we had. Uh, it's just a partnership arrangement, so I'm not going to go through all these things that we just talked about. The thing that I want you to, to understand is this comment. It's the way the net income is allocated between the buyer and the seller. And so this is just an example of how the income could be allocated. The buyer here is buying a 50% interest. Uh, year one, he's just an associate making 150000 per year. Year two is when the buy-in occurs, <clears throat> and that's when they become a partner. So you can see here they start pay repaying the debt in year two uh, because they've become a partner now. Now the income is allocated between the two doctors based on some type of formula or some type of agreement. As we said, it could be that you get 50% immediately. It could be that there's some type of incremental increase per year to recognize that as the practice grows, uh, the buyer gets more and more of the income because otherwise if the, if the seller were to give up 50% immediately, then uh, they're just taking a big pay decrease. So um, this one is explained as, as here, and again, this is just an example, that 60% of the cash flow is allocated based upon total clinical days worked. And then the remaining 40% of the net cash is allocated 10% 10, 10 to the buyer in year one, then 20% to the buyer in year two, then 30%, 40%, 50% until they basically become equal. Again, there's, there's many different ways to do this, but this is just an example. And the, and the reason we do these cash flows, again, is to show you uh, or to prove to you that you can do this, this type of buy-in. Okay? Uh, again, it may be a different allocation model, but when you're looking at this to say, okay, every year I'm taking a pay increase. I start out at 150000 per year. After I pay my taxes, that's 110000 in cash flow. Now I'm increasing every year. So this makes sense to me, okay? Um, again, there may be different profit allocations. The one thing we want to point out here, because we try to make both, we try to make sure that both parties understand the other one's situation, and to understand why the transaction may be structured like it is, okay? And I probably should have put in the seller's cash flow, but but I didn't. So we'll we'll, we'll talk through this here. Um, in this transaction, is assumed that the seller is financing this purchase price. So the purchase interest that is being repaid by the buyer and the purchase principal repaid by the buyer equals about $160,000 per year. That is being paid to the seller 
for the ownership interest that he, he or she has sold. So in addition to whatever the, the seller has allocated in income, uh, he's also getting about $160,000, $165,000 in debt service uh, for repayment of the purchase loan. What we want to point out here is year one, when the buyer was an associate, the seller's income was $873,000. And that's after paying the associate's salary. So if the practice is about the same before the associate came in, you know, the seller was making over a million dollars per year, or right at a million dollars per year. Now he's making eight seventy three. In year two, the first year of the buy-in, there's a, just a little bit over a million dollars in total income to be allocated between the partners. The buyer is getting $350,000 of that. So the seller is getting $700,000 of that. Plus, he's getting the debt repayment for the sale of the practice of about 160000 So he's at about eight sixty. And you can go through the math each year here, and what you'll see is that the seller has taken a pay cut. And again, we've got a nominal growth rate in here, 2% per year. By year seven, he's where everything's allocated basically equally, 50-50, the seller is now making about $580,000 plus about one hundred sixty in debt service. Once that debt service is paid off in seven years, the seller is making less than $600,000 per year. So we always want to point this out to the seller, and the seller has to understand is this is an expensive proposition, and that's why partnership deals, it may be an incremental increase or an incremental buy-in for the buyer, okay? It's not, it's not that you're immediately going to get to buy 50% of the practice in most cases. Um, and that's why also it's usually that the practice needs to be growing for this to make sense to the seller. Otherwise, the seller has to acknowledge that they're going to take a pay decrease, and they're okay with that, okay? So again, we do these cash flows for both parties to make sure they understand what they're entering into. So that was the uh, transition negotiations. The next is the association period. And the association period is really just the employment agreement. Um, <clears throat> and the things to think about when you're going to enter into an employment agreement, and the first three here are really whether you're entering into an employment agreement um, and only being an employee with no, no intent to ever buy into the practice, or if you're going to enter into a, a practice with the intent to buy. You want to think about these things. One, again, is the length of the association period. If you know you want to be an owner sooner rather than later, you need to negotiate that, you know, I'd rather this not take so long, especially in a buyout situation. You know, you, you don't want to be there for four years before you get to buy the practice. So if that's a concern to you, you want to make sure that's negotiated. The compensation rate. Um, again, how much are you going to be paid? Is it a per diem rate? Is it a salary? And we'll talk about this on the next slide a little bit more. Um, you know, also, what are the benefits and things like that? The other, the other one is the non-compete. The non-compete can be a um, very hotly negotiated item in these transactions. The reason being is that these things are really enforceable. And if you sign a non-compete that says you cannot practice in the area uh, or, or within a 10-mile 10, 10 radius of the seller's practice for two years after, the, after a termination, no matter what the termination was for, you need to abide by that non-compete agreement. The reason being is that, again, they're enforceable, and the only way to really enforce a non-compete is to go through the courts and litigate it. So you're in a situation where you have agreed to a non-compete, whether it's reasonable or not, and you have agreed to that. Now, if you breach it, the selling doctor may go after you and sue you for this. Uh, it can cost a lot of money to litigate these things or try to defend yourself. Um, and the problem is you're uh, in litigation with a senior doctor who's probably pretty well off, has a good income stream from his practice, his or her practice, and can afford, if they really wanted to, to spend ten or fifteen or twenty thousand dollars to make it painful for you not to operate in the area. Whereas you, as a you know newly graduated resident, uh, probably is still a lot of school debt. You may not have made a lot of money depending on how long you've been working for this seller or this uh, this employer. You don't have the financial means or the time to go challenge this non-compete or this breach. So um, you don't want to breach these non-competes. And that's why when you're entering into these employment agreements, you want to make sure you understand what the non-compete terms are. And if you have issue with them, bring them to the attention of the employer sooner rather than later. Um, it may be that they won't budge on them, but at least you, you've got the dialogue there. And it may be that you say, I'm from this town. I want to be in this town and stay in this town. You know, my choices are to work for you or work for somebody else or start my own practice. I do not want to be kicked out of the area. So can we at least have a carve-out that 
if I start my own practice, I want to start over here five miles away, and here's the location, and carve that area out. Again, the seller may not agree to it, but at least you've laid that out on the table to understand whether he or she will or not. Um, <clears throat> there also could be things about, you know, let's not have the, the non-compete be enforced for the first three to four months of my employment agreement because if we don't like each other and can't work together, we'll know that fairly quickly, and so therefore I'd like to be able to get out of this deal and go work wherever I want to. I haven't really caused you any harm if I've only been here for three or four months. Again, not saying the seller will agree to that, but you might want to mention it. Um, and then this last one here for the employment agreement is buying the buyout terms. Again, we want to talk through if you know you're going to buy the practice or you want to become a partner, you want to make sure those buying and buyout terms are in writing. And it's not going to be the employment agreement. It's going to be in some type of separate document, whether it's a purchase agreement, a uh, letter of intent, or, or something like that that really spells out the terms. You want to make sure you understand when do I get to buy in, what's price, all these other things. This slide is the uh, resident survey that we do every year. These are the results from the 2012 resident uh, survey that we did. And, and if you participated in that, we, we really thank you for that. Uh, this is a chart that says, what is the expectation of first-year annual income for residents? And you'll see the large majority, over 80% of, uh, of, of residents, expected a, an income between $100,000 and $200,000. And that's about right. The average that we see is about $140,000 to $165,000 or so. Um, and, and a lot of these depend, though, as far as what type of practice you're entering into. Um, and when I say, when I was talking about a salary there, 140 to 165,000. If you're entering into a practice that is really a, a corporate dentistry type place or a, a clinical operation like Western Dental in, in, in the West Coast, those are opportunities where there is no chance of ever having ownership in those practices. So you know you're going to go in there, treat a lot of patients, work as much as you can, and do clinical work. Uh, there's, there's no buying opportunity uh, or anything like that. So usually those are per diem type things. And you may not be guaranteed, you know, set number of days per week. You may, you know, work as much as they want you to. You may be working in numerous offices. Uh, but you can make a lot of money in those things because the per diem rates can average between 800 to, you know, 12 or $1,300 per day. You know, if you're working over 200 days per year at $1,300 per day, that's a lot of money. Uh, but I would caution you that if you're entering into a practice that the intent is that you will eventually become an owner of that practice, whether a partner or buy the whole practice, you're usually on a salary basis, and it's usually in a range of, you know, again, 140 to 160 or so, plus some benefits. That's a full-time opportunity. You know, you're working probably four days a week. You have some responsibility with marketing. Uh, you're expected to help grow the practice or, or, you know, market the practice and things like that because, again, the, the main carrot, you know, the, the carrot dangling on the string, the reward is, is that you eventually own this practice. So the reward is not that you're going to get paid a lot of money, you know, you're not going to get paid top dollar here because you're really money out of the, out of the seller doctor's pocket uh, until, until the transaction occurs. Uh, it may be that the employment agreement is really just sort of incidental to the actual purchase agreement that's going to happen in the future. So uh, just be cognizant of that when you're looking at, you know, what is my pay going to be when I'm entering this practice, especially if you're entering into a smaller practice or a one-doctor practice. Um, but to, to keep that in mind, that's some of the ranges uh, depends on uh, what type of practice you're entering into, what's the size of the practice, and what's the ultimate goal of why you're there. So that was the association period. The last thing here is the ownership transfer, and this is after you know, you've had the negotiations, you've been an employee now, and now you're going to buy the practice, either buy into the practice or buy the practice. Now, I think I've said in the past that uh, we actually have some buyouts that occur where there's not an association period. The buyer just buys the practice immediately, and then the seller works back but the ownership transfer here is the, is the last piece. And this is just a set of legal documents or a list of legal documents. We're not going to go through these other than noting that um, there can be a lot of documents in these transactions. Um, you know, depending on what type of transaction you're doing, if you're doing a 100% sale, that's uh, usually an asset purchase agreement. Uh, there may be, you know, there's going to be promissory notes, whether it's from the bank or whether it's from the, uh, from the seller. With a partnership, there's all these documents plus some type of partnership arrangements that explains what are our responsibilities to each other as co-owners of this business, you know, how are uh, profits allocated, um, what are buy-sell arrangements, all those other things that we talked about that you have to consider in, in partnership deals. Can you get money? Um, and the short answer is yes. Uh, there's a lot of uh, national banks out there that do these deals. 
Um, you can you know, usually go to like a like a, say Bank of America or a PNC or something like that, or Wells Fargo does some of these deals, uh, and they usually lend on averages. So once you start getting over certain percentage of collections, you know that you know some of them say we won't lend more than 85% of collections. A lot of them, some of them, they say for newly newly graduated residents, we won't lend more than $800,000 or something to that effect. So it depends, uh, but you know if you have good credit, uh, you can usually get some money, even um, even if you have a lot of student loans. What the banks have told us, they'd like to see uh, cash in the bank uh, versus paying down a lot of the student debt first because they'd like to know that you have a cushion if you need to make some payments. Uh, but there's money to be had up there. The the interest rates that we're seeing from banks right now uh, are ranging between 45 to 6%, which is really low. Just two years ago, they were at um, you know 65 to 8.5%, so they've come down quite a bit. Uh, again, once you get over thresholds, and maybe the seller has to carry some of the some of the uh, promissory note for you. What we typically see in these buyouts is that the seller wants as much cash as possible uh, when the transaction occurs. So they want you to go get money. Now in partnership arrangements, the seller a lot of times says, I don't want a bank involved in this partnership deal, I'll finance the deal for you. But even in partnership deals, depending on how the transaction is structured, you can go to a bank and get the money. Uh, so there's, uh, the main thing is making sure your credit's good and, and finding a deal that cash flows and works and the bank the banks like it. So that's uh, most of the that's pretty much the presentation. And one thing I want to point out is we do have a, a quarterly uh, newsletter called the Benson Clark Resource, uh, written specifically for the orthodontic industry. Um, uh, it goes through a lot of these things that we just talked about. We do an annual review evaluation every done. We have consultants write for, uh, throughout the industry that talk about you know marketing and and other issues, patient acceptance, things like that ways to manage your practice. We have legal and transition uh, type uh, articles in there. It's a lot of good information. Uh, you can contact our office if you want any more information on that. It's a good way for us to stay in touch with you. So um, we thank you so much uh, for joining us in this webinar, and thanks to GAC Dent Supply for organizing and sponsoring this valuable program. And finally, we just want to wish you good luck as you transition from your residency to your professional orthodontic career. Thank you. <laughs>